If you're looking for a video that shows you everything you need to make a physics-based floating character controller in Unity, then you're in the right place. For anyone new to the channel, this floating character controller started from the character controller 1.0 release, which we finished up in a 20 video series on this channel. The complete project is available for you to download for free. The link to download the project has been made available on the 1Z1 Games Community Discord server. You can find the link to join the Discord server in the video description below. If you're looking to manually recreate the project I'm about to show you in this video, then it would certainly be a good idea to start with the 1.0 release as a base to build on. Also, there's a small release I did that includes a basic animation implementation. I was getting a lot of questions about animations, so I threw it together for you. The link to download the entire project can also be found on the community Discord server. With that out of the way, let's jump right in and take a look at what we have going on here. So here we are in the Unity Editor. Not much has changed here. We did add some terrain in the background, you can see. And I did also get rid of the rotating and moving platform because I haven't added support for that yet with this floating character controller. It's a little more complicated. But other than that, all we really need to look at here is I did clean up the inspector panel a bit for our humanoid land controller script. There's a lot more stuff going on here now. And also I separate things out and categorize to make things a little cleaner so that it's clearly marked what is actually for configuration purposes and what is just for debug purposes. We'll see that more in just a second when we get into the actual script. And if we go back and we look again at the scene panel here, you can see that the green wireframe, that's actually our collider, is actually currently taking up the full height of our actual capsule object. So technically this doesn't represent that we're actually going to be able to float, but that all gets calculated and adjusted as soon as we start up our script. You'll see that in a second. But I just wanted to point that out. Pay attention to this green thing. That's our actual collider. And you know what, let's go ahead and let's just start it. And you can see that our player is indeed actually floating now. Our collider automatically adjusted based upon our configuration. And we'll go ahead and we'll unmaximize this scene view. And we'll maximize our game view now. I'm not going to have enough time in one video to go over every little feature, but I'll try to summarize it here real quick. This character controller pretty much has all the same features as its predecessor. But of course we can jump and we can crouch. And you notice when we jump we actually over penetrate the ground a little bit and then we slowly rise back up. Basically like a shock wood on a car. That's how you notice it's a floating character controller. Likewise, if we run on over here and we run up these little blocks, see that we kind of float above them. And as we go over them, we kind of kick them out from underneath us. Additionally, another thing that I added is we have these floating platforms now. See when I jump, come down, the floating platform actually has a little bit of a cushion to it. So that's kind of cool. You can also kind of move them here. So there's that. And overall, it's just a pretty smooth, good feeling character controller. I will show this real quick. This is another little thing I added in. It's no big deal. But uh, this little ball here, if you just run up to it, you touch it. And then you fall down to another floating platform. And then likewise, if you go over here and you touch this sphere, you go back to the other floating platform. So here we are, we have some train here in front of us, and this is where the real benefit of a floating character controller comes in, is that a train isn't necessarily smooth in its movements, so if you have a first person camera like this for example, and if you were to go over it with the type of character controller that we were dealing with before, where you had collider on collider, it'd be kind of choppy and not very smooth or fluid in its movement, it just wouldn't look good. Whereas with this type of character controller, where we're floating, if we go over it, it just kind of acts kind of naturally and gives you nice smooth fluid movement, and it just looks good. So yeah, I think that's all I'm going to go over right now. Again, try and keep this video shorter. So let's go ahead and let's jump to the code and let's review all of that. Okay, so here we are. This is our float object script. This is the script that we're using to actually float our platform that I showed you earlier. We're using the exact same method here as we do for our character controller to float our actual player. I've made sure to initialize all of our variables with the values that I'm actually using. So the values that are in my inspector panel are also the same values that are here in my script. Speaking of the inspector panel, here's a screenshot of the inspector panel for the floating platform that I'm using. Just so you can get the exact same values if that's what you're after. And we'll scroll down just a little bit more here so you can see the whole script. Pretty straightforward. Let's go ahead and let's move on now to our teleport on collision script. This is the script that's running attached to those little spheres that are teleporting me. It's very, very simple. You can see it's literally like two lines of code. So obviously we just have a sphere with a collider on it. I attach this script to that. In line 5 here, we have a serializable field. It's a transform. We're calling it teleport2. 
That's all we do here in our inspector panel. We just link in whatever game object we want to teleport to when we have a collision with this object. And then the on collision enter function. We're taking the game object that collided into the sphere and we're going to teleport it to the position of our teleport to. And it's just going to be 100 units above that game object. So really, really simple. Let's move on to the next one. Next, we have our manipulator script, which is the exact same script we're using, actually. Uh, the only thing I changed here is I made one little update all the way down at the bottom. I commented out the entire on collision enter function. And instead, what I did is up here on the on trigger stay, we're now checking for the distance between the object that we're attracting and the object that this script is attached to. And we're checking to see if it's within half a unit away, basically. We're just using our other bounds extends.y because we're attracting cubes, so it's almost always going to be the same unless it's on a slight angle, but that's fine. It's close enough. And as long as it's within half a unit, then we're going to go ahead and we're going to remove, destroy, and count the game object. And on to the next one, we have our humanoid land input script. And all I changed here was I added a crouch toggle was pressed this frame. And that was just for development purposes. I got tired of holding the crouch button, so I added a toggle real quick. And as well in the update function here, we're just going ahead and we're setting the value of that. So really, that's it for other scripts. All we have left now is the actual humanoid land controller script, which is a massive script, unfortunately. This script weighs in at exactly 866 lines of code. That can be pretty daunting, but I promise you it's taken me far more hours to refine this to the point that it is currently than it'll ever take you to copy it. However, if you do want a shortcut, the complete project that we're looking at in this video has actually been available to my patrons on Patreon for a few months now already. Shout out to all my patrons, you're all awesome, because without your support, I likely would have never even made this video or anything hereafter. With that mentioned, time for a shameless Patreon plug. I have a Patreon in which I try to provide some added value for people who want to show some support. Over on the Patreon, I have added images of varying amounts of tacos to each tier to give you an optimistic idea of how many tacos you're potentially allowing me to afford. So if you feel I've done you a solid, feel free to help support my taco addiction. It's very much appreciated and goes a long way towards fueling me to make some more awesome content for you. The perks are all laid out on the Patreon page. They include early access to content and projects, Discord perks, and fully commented code releases. Anyway, back to the floating character chore is a vast improvement over the series that we just completed on this channel. That character chore rides on the surface of whatever is below the player, which in a lot of scenarios is not ideal. To make it more ideal, this controller uses physics to float the character's collider above whatever is actually below the player. I started making this controller because I didn't see this explained very well anywhere else with the exception of a video for a game called Very Very Valet. If you haven't seen that video, I suggest you check it out. If you're interested, I'll throw some links in the description of this video just for your convenience and also give credit where credit is due, of course. That said, I want to give a quick shout out to Toyful Games for putting out some very interesting content on their channel. It got me amped up enough to do any of this in the first place. Again, links are in the description. And now finally, let's take a look together at what we ended up with here. So at the very top, of course, we have our usings or our includes, whatever you want to call them. And then, of course, we have all of our global variable declarations. There's quite a few of them. I'm just going to page down through them, stopping for a few seconds. But you have time to pause the screen, take a closer look. Otherwise, I'm going to keep going until we land on a section that I actually want to make a comment on. So here we go. I'm going to go ahead and press page down. And again. And again. Going further down. And I'm going to scroll down to the awake section. In the awake section, we're just caching our components inside of variables and setting a bunch of other variables initially when the game first starts up. And just below that, in the update function, we're actually handling our input properly here. And that's just handling our crouch toggle function. And this right here is a prime example of how it should be handled properly. But I don't want to get into all that right now, so let's keep moving down to our fixed update function. And this is where most all of the magic happens. And as you can see, it's very, very similar to what we had before, but there's a lot more going on here. But let's keep on going down through because we have a long ways yet to go. So here we have a kind of interesting function called set skin width. And in the inspector panel, I'm really not ever checking to see what values are being inputted, but here's a check that I did implement for whatever reason. I was feeling a little overzealous, I guess. But if you were to set the skin width to be less than zero, then we're going to go ahead and we're going to set the skin width to zero because it can't be less than zero. It should never be less than zero. Else, if the skin width is greater than half our max capsule collider radius, then we're going to go ahead and we're just going to limit our skin width to be half our max capsule collider radius. Finally, we're going to set our capsule collider radius to be the result of our max capsule collider radius minus our determined skin width. So in a minute here, we're going to scroll down further and we'll see what exactly we use this skin width for. But just know that it is optional. If you were to set the skin width to a zero or negative value, then it's effectively not going to be used at all. So let's keep moving. Our player ground check function got quite a bit more complex. We're using a lot more variables here to keep track of things. And now finally, our new player stairs function. 
Now keep in mind, this is still far from being complete. This is still a work in progress. For example, here we have our player with ascending stairs last frame variable that's not even being used, but I still have it here for some reason. And then I have a to-do comment, but I didn't actually put a comment, so I don't even remember what I was thinking because when I put this all together, I haven't touched this in three, probably almost four months now at least. But anyway, this part is at least similar where if input move is pressed, so we're telling our character to move, then we're going to go ahead and we're going to call our stair handling function. Otherwise, if not players ascending stairs, then we're going to go ahead and we're going to call our stair handling function. But this time we have our faults boolean telling us that we're descending stairs and not ascending stairs. And then further down here, we just have some resets. And we're not going to worry about going over any of that in this video, but here is our stair handling function. This now handles both whether we are ascending stairs or descending stairs. So we don't have two separate functions anymore. And we're going to scroll down. A lot, a lot of if statements. I know I'm not exactly thrilled about it either. This is definitely something that should be reworked into multiple functions. That the function can be named and be more descriptive so that it's more obvious what exactly is going on here. And moving on down further. And some more. Here we go. And that's finally it for player stairs. <laughs> Wasn't so bad, right? Right? Right. No, not so bad. It was, it was pretty terrible, to be honest. But like I said, work in progress. Let's not get too hung up on it. Let's move down now to our player slope function. As I mentioned before, this is reworked now as well, and I'm actually really happy of how this one turned out. We introduced sliding and a slide counter, which when that's triggered, I really like how the controller feels. Let's scroll down just a little bit more here. Now here we have going on a lot more than we ever did before, but again, I really like how this makes the controller feel. I think it works really well, although I'm sure this could be optimized to be a lot better still. And let's keep going, we're about two thirds of the way through this now. And this finishes up the player slope function, and we'll get ready to scroll on down to the player surroundings function next. The player surroundings function is pretty interesting, this is where the skin width gets used. Let's go ahead and scroll down to that now. So as mentioned before, if the skin width is not greater than zero, then this function won't be called at all anyway. It'll be disabled, so it's optional to use it if you don't want to use a skin width, you don't have to use one. But basically what we do is we shrink down our capsule collider's radius, calculate the direction we want to go, multiply that by our skin width, and subtract it from our current position. What that effectively does is it gives us a point behind our player to spawn our capsule cast at. So then we spawn the capsule cast behind us, and we send it in the direction of our desired movement. We limit the distance it travels to twice our skin width, which again is because we're spawning at one skin width behind us, so we need to travel twice that to go the proper distance in front of us. So we're basically detecting stuff before our collider actually even hits it. And on a side note, as you can see by my notes, this is a work in progress, but it's already working pretty well. The whole purpose of this though is to allow the player some wiggle room to fit into tight places, and it also eliminates friction since if the capsule cast detects something it can't ascend upwards, it takes the player's velocity and deflects it basically along its border. I know, I know, it's a little complex, I didn't take much time to explain that at all, but here's the code, and you're welcome. And now let's keep going, we're rapidly approaching the end. If you watch the Crouch tutorial, then there's not a whole lot to see here. Let's we'll scroll down some more. And some more. And rapidly approaching the end. A little bit further. And we're finally at our player flow function. Fortunately, this is also a very small function and it's pretty simple. So as long as our player is not falling, then we're going to get a dot product of the reverse of our ground check hits normal and our rigid body's velocity. And we're ultimately going to say that our float force equals our player distance from ground times our float distance modifier minus our dot down val times our float val modifier. So basically what we're doing is we're taking our distance and our velocity in the account to apply the proper amount of float force to get us to where we want to be perfectly in the middle. Optionally, I have this commented out right now, but optionally, you can obviously clamp this value as well. And this next part, I'm not exactly in love with, but it is what it is. If our player is ascending stairs, then we don't want to float at all. Finally, we apply the float force by subtracting it from our calculated player float force. And then that's it. We're done. We just go ahead and return the value. However, if our player is falling, then of course, we're just going to reset our float force back to zero. In the next function here, we have recenter player collider. And this used to be a part of our crouch function, but I decided to separate it out because this really needs to be checked every frame now. So here it is, it's its own thing. 
And for this, we have our rigid body player reaction function. And I don't know if you remember, but in the beginning of the video, when we were running over all those little cubes and someone would go flying up in the air, but I wasn't jumping, I was just running over them. That's because of this. It's kind of experimental. It's just something I put in there for fun. So if you don't like that, you can just comment this out and that's that. So moving right along to the next one, we have our player jump. And this did change just a little bit because along with floating our character controller, things got a little more complicated with our player jump and its reset. But it does seem to be working good now. Let's go ahead and get the rest in view. And even more jump code. And we're almost there. And that's it. We're at the end. Of course, we have our kick stuff out from under function. So if you don't want that to happen either, you can comment that out. And after that, we have our enforce minimum velocity function, which is just taking the magnitude of our ridge body's velocity and check and see if it's less than our minimum velocity magnitude that we have set. If it is, then we're just going to go ahead and we're going to set our ridge body's velocity to zero. And the whole point of this is just to make sure that we're not doing any unnecessary calculations and to make sure our player doesn't drift ever so slightly when he's not supposed to be. And last but not least, I just have a helper function here called is within range and it just checks to see if a certain value is within a certain range. And I've used that a grand total of three times in this script. We made it through. Hopefully it wasn't as bad as you thought it was going to be. I hope it's apparent to you how much effort I've put into this and how much work overall it's been. So at this point, I'm going to ask you if you haven't already, please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel because obviously I have some quality content here. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments below or feel free to jump on our community discord server and ask there. The link to join discord server is in the description below. I tried to keep this video as to the point as possible and as short as possible. I hope you found it helpful. If you have any suggestions for another video or if you'd like me to go more in depth in something on this video, let me know in the comments below. I look forward to hearing from you and until next time, I'll see you later.